one of my you know beliefs in life is to you know to live a life without that glass ceiling self-imposed glass ceiling i don't know what my potential is so if i said oh i want to just finish it i yeah. might have had the capacity for more yeah. so when i aim for number one it's not to be number one and beat the world it's to just see how far i can go Welcome to a very special episode of Strong Voice. I'm here today with the wonderful Jeff Smith, yet we're twisting the roles. So we're mixing it up. Jeff is actually going to be interviewing me about my upcoming challenges because albeit he's achieved some amazing things in his life and is still pursuing greatness in his personal life as well as sharing this message with hundreds of others. We thought that it would be a nice change for Jeff to actually impart his knowledge through some maybe tricky questions about what I'm coming up. So welcome and thank you for joining me, Jeff. Thank you very much. I think you sounded a bit nervous there. I think when we had our previous conversation, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you. And I think maybe there's a little bit of nervousness. Would I be correct in saying that? There, there is, you know, because um, <laughs> when I, I like control, I don't know what you're going to ask me. This is my podcast. Um, <laughs> But I, I think I'm going to embrace it because what I don't know, I need to know, and it'll give me a place to find out the answers as well. Yeah, listen, we're good friends. I'm going to be kind. I, I just want to just get the best out of you and, and I want the audience to recognise some of the stuff that maybe you hide on a regular basis, which is the good stuff. And what I think our relationship has proved over time has been that we're not very good self-promotion so the reason and the rationale behind me wanting to interview you is so that I can actually promote you and promote some of the stuff that you're doing which you very kindly did for me when you interviewed me in your podcast recently so just as a start point for which I don't think we actually touched on um, when we did the interview with you with myself and you um, was where we met and how, how things kind of transpired. I'm not sure if you, I, I was gonna prompt you, but I wanna let, let you explain how you think we met and what your memories are of what we, how we went about that meeting. Yeah, so my memory is it was, I think it was around February time, uh, a few years ago, and I just got a text from a mutual friend saying, this guy is supporting another vegan triathlete, do something crazy, do you wanna go for a coffee and see if you can help? And so that day I met you, there was Mark Colburn as well, our mutual friends, as well as um, Matt Pritchard. And Matt was embarking on a 30 day half, up marathon, half Ironman every single day for 30 days. And you were pretty much supporting him 100% in completing that endeavor and raising a lot of awareness for, for charities. And from memory, we just clicked. I, um, I was enjoying joining you on a few of those uh, swims in particular and maybe one or two of the rides as well and uh, that's that's pretty much how we met and that was as you mentioned in Analoka, which is a vegan restaurant in cardiff yeah that's and right Matt richard is a vegan as are you and influenced by you and matt and various other people i've gone plant-based for about six months now so i just wanted to say thank you and it's interesting how sometimes small seeds actually sort of grow into things so whilst you never i don't think you've ever suggested to me that i go plant-based um but i've sort of watched athletes including yourself and matt do some amazing stuff and realized that it was the direction i wanted to go on so massive thank you to you for prompting me to sort of uh, play your role in getting me to be in a plant-based position where I feel amazing about myself in many, many ways. And I've just come off a recent small challenge, which um, is a physical one, which I recovered from probably the best I've ever recovered from in any of my challenges. So I massively think it's about diet and I don't want to keep beating the drum, but just wanted to say thank you about that really. So um, where, where we went after that was we just became friends, but probably, six months i'm trying to get my timeline right but probably about six or eight months ago um you asked me about potentially a challenge that you were going to be doing with your dad and your dad is 70 he's 72 now okay it was 71 last year 
obviously. So can you tell me a little bit about how that meeting went and what the reason and the behind yeah. the scenes were on that meeting? Yeah, very true. So um, my father at the age of 70 realised that he was getting old. I know that's a bit late to realise that maybe. And quite a lot of what he'd set up to do later in his life, he was getting to that point of now or never. And one of them, the biggest dream he's had for over 30 years, we've been talking about this, was to climb Mont Blanc. And at 70, he thought he'd missed the boat. But I, I, I strongly suggested to him to, to really do some research, some revisit it, and I would also attempt it with him to support him along the way. And I knew that, that you are a huge adventurer. You've summited Mont Blanc. You've also climbed Everest as amongst other mountains as well. And you know, with, uh, this is the truth, you are a hugely inspirational individual because you do it for other things than yourself. You use it for a platform for your message. So I invited my dad to join us for a coffee in your cafe called uh, Big Moose, which is also a charity in itself giving to local communities in Cardiff, to, to inspire my dad to realize that climbing a mountain is possible for everyone. And the mountain doesn't have to be that physical mountain or feet as well. And it's the journey, not the summit. Because I'm really clear for, for your message and what inspires me to stay connected with you, Jeff, is that regardless of the outcome, we celebrate the path. And I wanted that message to be imprinted in my father because he's very outcome orientated, which is wonderful. But at 71, attempting Mont Blanc, there was a possibility of him not accomplishing that. And I didn't want him to be seeing that as a failure. I wanted him to see the process as the success. So I invited him to join us, and that's, again, a few months ago, how we started talking more about um, our own personal journeys rather than supporting other people like Matt. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, very much so. And what, I, what I'd like to ask you is if you could just explain for people that don't know the same as you and I do, some details about Mont Blanc. So the location, the height, the, what it entails to actually climb, because um, whilst people might be familiar there'll be some people that are listening to this who've not got any clue so if you could just explain a little bit about what Mont Blanc actually represents. Sure so Mont Blanc is a beautiful mountain in the Alps which is the southeast of France also bordering um, I think Switzerland and stretching down into potentially the north of Italy as well yeah. and and it's important to my family because we've been visiting, my parents live in France, so we've been looking at this mountain every single day since I was 14 years old. And so it's this beautiful, white, majestic, calm looking mountain, yet now and then you see swirls of violent clouds exuding off it, knowing that you know, this, this mountain has something that may attract and allure you, but is also quite dangerous and powerful in her own right. And from memory, please correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's 4,810 meters. And I think that's correct, yeah. It isn't the highest peak in the in the Europe. There's one uh, that's in in Russia that's higher, but it mm -hmm. is still known as quite quite a challenging climb. Very challenging, especially for somebody who's 70 years of age. So uh, I think your dad um to approach doing it was very brave and i think that bravery was um shown to me when i met you and your dad in the coffee shop and we discussed it so so talk us through some of the dangers because i've climbed the mountain as you said and i'm i know what it's a, what it's like and what it's about so if you can just explain to everybody how the process went for you from the base camp or, or the, the foot of the mountain sure well, it starts off pretty easily with a meandering path going through some rocky rubble. It's all naturally formed, but uh, it looks a little bit like you would imagine uh, a the base of a volcano. So lots of smaller stones leading into larger boulders. And the higher up the, the, the sort of the, the path also got steeper and steeper and steeper. And also the temperatures dropping at this point as well. And interestingly, throughout this meandering of a path, there's also um, gullies. So while, you, while we're walking in a gully, if you look up, it's, it's like walking in a filter funnel or a funnel. If anything fell at the top, it would all be funneled directly onto us. So there is a very high risk of any 
rock falling that could potentially hit us on the head. So there are some, some very gnarly points where velocity is integral, but also under safety. So I remember at some point in this one of the gullies, I was tied together with my father and also our guide. And the guide said, for the next two minutes, do not stop running. And this is over a, a flowing shingle path. And the fear in my heart is if anyone up higher up the mountain dropped a rock, that could fall on me. So do not stop, keep moving. The tempo was like this for our feet. And we were pretty much dragged by our guide across this gully for fear of, you know, if we stopped, the, we could be caught up in a, in a landslide. So, you know, the adrenaline's pumping as well. And the higher we go up, we start to rock climb, which means it's now almost vertical. And the snow starts to build in as well. So we're not just tackling climbing a rock. We're also tackling potentially sliding or hitting ice or our feet slipping as well. And, and then the rock slowly dissipates and we're left with pure snow and ice. And uh, if you've ever been, if anyone's ever been around snow, the, the sun reflecting off it can actually create a sort of shear that looks quite smooth. But in essence, behind it could be, could be boulders that we fall over of ice, or it could even be um, we've got crevasses, so like vertical slits in the ice, which we could fall through as well. So and you've never climbed a mountain before? I'd done a few days before. I have, I have climbed a few mountains, but nothing of this extremity. And for days, this takes three, three plus days. So um, just to put it into context, we, we, we hiked 10 kilometers, which is six miles. It took us seven hours to cover that distance. So, so it's very physically challenging as well. And the altitude, sorry, gone. How did you find that with your dad? Was your dad, because bear in mind he's 70 years of age, how was his fitness? And how did you, how were your, were you ever concerned about him? Because whilst, um, and I've climbed the mountain with my daughter, so it was kind of role reversal. But I know that whilst looking after myself and making sure that I was strong and fit, I also had to look after her. So did you feel a similar kind of thing with your father? A little bit, but um, you know, the physical aspect was taken care of by our guide. There's no way we would have done it without a, a, a trained professional. And we were roped together. So as long as the rope was taut, that we didn't walk too close together, I, I, I believed in his fitness. Yeah. And we, at some points we did take it a little slower, more for the technical aspect of it than you know, his age, because some areas I was taking it slow as well. Yeah. But it, for me, the, my support to him was the mental support. Uh, it, I work very well with the fear of the unknown. Uh, not knowing everything doesn't fear paralyze me into stopping. But for yeah. my father, it became apparent that he didn't know how he coped with altitude. He didn't know how he could walk in the night. There was a lot of unknowns that were piling up on him that was yeah. creating overwhelm. So my, my, pure, my, pure, my job was to, to unpack each one of those what ifs and fears Yep. to get him to make one step, then one step. I knew physically he could do it, but it was the mental pressure he was putting himself under that I, I supported yeah, right. him through. And with regards to, um, you said it took three days, and I, if you did it the same way that I did it, I, we stopped at a hut and slept overnight. Did you do the same thing? Yeah, we stopped at two, two different huts, yeah. Um, and describe the huts and describe your kind of feelings, because I remember how I felt sort of in taking on this kind of thing which I wasn't really used to and it's it's quite in, interesting how you cope so how did you cope with your dad in these kinds of situations with the huts well they're very they're very primitive so even if they one of them's new build so a few years old the other one was about 20 years old and when I say primitive there's no running water so to wash our hands is an impossibility to brush our teeth we had to use the water we carried up um, and it's very male dominated. So yeah. we're put into a room of 20, I wouldn't say beds, 20 mattresses. Yeah. And you pick a mattress and you lay down and you, you, I wouldn't say sleep, you just lay on it, trying to close your eyes, but the altitude is preventing sleep for arriving. And, and there is a smell, because again, no running water. Uh, 
for days people haven't showered myself included so so there is a sort of sort of every sense of every sense of my um body was being stimulated some some not for the positive so um there was a sort of underlying three-day-old people smell uh not the, the consciousness of not being able to wash my hands and and the food is what you're given so being vegan they very generously gave me whole food and plant-based food which was wonderful but but there was no choice it was just everyone on a big table eating together playing cards together and at 8 p.m laying down to see if sleep comes or not very primitive indeed mm. not selling it to people are you <laughs> no <laughs> type two fun definitely type two fun so so once you've left the hut um on your summit push describe how the journey then took you and what time of day you started for that well we started at half past two in the morning so mm. breakfast was at three o'clock we were on we were outside around half past three in the pitch black. We're wearing crampons, which are big ice shoes that sit over our boots that add extra grip as we're walking with, with head torches of our helmet on every single time. And there was an impressive silence. So all we could hear was, all I could hear was my own beating of my heart and my breath and the crunch of the snow under my feet. And I was taking baby steps. So basically my toe was hitch touching my heel pretty much as we slowly moved up the mountain. And I actually got very emotionally overwhelmed in a beautiful way and started to cry. And I didn't stop for maybe two or three hours because, really? yeah, yeah, looking up, I could see all these little dots of other people doing similar to me further torch. ahead of me yeah the head torches of the people ahead of me yeah. and then looking up again i could see the dots of the stars and it was as if we were all connected and as the sun slowly reached to rise the sunrise and this amazing view of the whole world opened up to me every single peak every single glint of you know the the the, the valley below of this the, the families and other communities waking up I got the impression of how small and infinitesimally small I was as well. So I was sort of caught between being like a dot in the scope of the world, but also connected to it all on such a deep level. And it, it just is the purest love I've ever felt in my life uh, in that moment for such a long period of time. And for two hours, I, I just walked up the mountain, um, pausing briefly as my cheeks started to freeze and hurt. Uh, with the tears and and we reached the summit of the mountain and my father and i just burst into tears together for for the relief because it the pain was over the yeah. absolute bitter cold uh, you know my hips were were aching from the cold the wind chafing into my into my trousers my fingers as well were losing the mobility um but also the joy that we did it. We did something that my father thought was pretty much impossible and we did it together. And that was just such a magical experience. It sounds it. And having done it myself, I, I completely concur with what you said. It's, it's very, it's almost spiritual. And I remember when you came back and we talked about it, there was a part of me that thought she's hooked. She's in. And I think I've had a, I think I've had a conversation where I've sort of said to you, What's the next mountain? So, which kind of segues into what you've got coming up. So Mont Blanc was a biggie um, and you obviously enjoyed it to a degree where you've decided that you're going to take on another mountain and some other challenges. So you've got three, um, which you've kind of launched very recently. And we've, we've had a conversation about those three challenges. I think it'd be very interesting for you to tell everybody what they actually are going to be. Sure. So, you know, I'm a triathlete at heart. Um, I don't like choice. I don't like having to choose one over the other. And being surrounded by people like yourself and other high achievers in different spheres got me thinking. And you're right, this, is, this isn't about ticking off from a list. This, is, to me, is, is a journey of spirituality and self-development and self-actualization. So the three challenges that I've got coming up are to cycle 
3,100 miles across America in an iconic race called Race Across America. And from where, which point to which point? Good question. From the West Coast to the East Coast. So it's CA to CO, California to somewhere on the East Coast, Annapolis. Okay. Cool. I'm not very good at geography, so I'll tell you afterwards. I'll tell you after I've done it where I've been. <laughs> So 3,100 miles, I mean, is that self-supporting or is that, uh, aid, with aid stations, is it a race that has help along the way or how does it work? I'll have a crew with me. So I will be cycling solo, but I will have a team behind me. And from what I've heard, it's around 10 people in two vehicles. So wow. the vehicles will rotate. They'll be in charge of, you know, navigating, making sure I have enough food, looking after themselves as well. Yep. And I'll be sleeping around two out two hours a day, uh, to average three hundred plus miles a day on the bike. Really, three hundred miles a day. Well, I'm intent. I'm training to be first female finisher as well in the race. So this is to to actually <laughs> you're completing, complete not just completing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's that makes a big difference because I've done some stuff stuff myself, but I'm a lot older than you, and I always aim to complete. The challenge rather than compete if it's a race because I'm, I'm past the age of competing apart from same age people but you're going to try to become the first female to actually uh, win basically you're trying to win the race yeah yeah and, and the reason I do it is I don't like capping myself one of my you know beliefs in life is to you know, to live a life without that glass ceiling, self-imposed glass ceiling. I don't know what my potential is. So if I said, oh, I want to just finish it, I yeah. might have had the capacity for more. Yeah. So when I aim for number one, it's not to be number one and beat the world. It's to just see how far I can go. Right. Okay. Sounds, sounds amazing. So you've got, you're going to need to get a big team. And then what time of year does that start? And what year are you looking to start that one? So that's, it's every June, except this year, um, due to lockdown. Uh, so it starts, I think, second week of June. And uh, my intention is to complete that in June 2022. So I've got just over, well, two years and one month of training to yep. get me race fit. Which should, should be feasible, shouldn't it? Yes, yeah, definitely. Well, it's going to be hard work. So have you got a coach for that? Yeah, I engaged a coach at the beginning of the year. Because I, I realised that, you know, I don't need to do this by myself. And why not lean on other people's great skill sets to help, yeah. to help me get over the line? Surround yourself with experts is always a good thing. Completely. That knowledgeable, so that's cool. So you've got, a, you've got a cycling coach who will be able to help you with the training. Will he or she be able to come with you on the journey, like over to America? Or are you going to... Well, well, he's actually based in America. Okay. Um, and, and he's completed it a couple of times himself, which is why I, I like him. Yeah. I, I don't know if he, he'll actually be part of the team because okay. I will have off-site team as well, like remote team. So yeah. I, I, I think he would be great at monitoring the data rather than driving the van. Right. So, so we'll be sending him daily my, my, you know, my heart rate, my distances, et cetera, et cetera. So he can make sure that I'm not burning out and not yeah. playing too small either. So you said it's approximately 3,000 miles and you're going to hopefully do 10, uh, 300 a day. So it's a, a 10 plus day challenge for the people that take part in the race. That's a long time, isn't it? So you're going to have to get your fueling right. You're going to need to get your crew in right. Crew is a massive part on these kinds of challenges, isn't it? It is. And, you know, I'm very clear in, in that I'm doing, a, I'm doing these challenges solo yeah. at... There's, there's dozens of people behind us, uh, behind me. So for, to get me over the line, it's just like the Tour de France, to get that one person in the yellow bib, there's yeah. a team of 200 behind that person. Yeah. I'm, I'm playing for you know, 10 to 20 people. Yeah. So it's about recruiting, as you said, the skill set that I don't have to be yeah. able to make sure all of us can elevate and grow together. Yeah. But I'm just the one who's doing the cycling. Someone else can do the planning or the this and the that, and we can all shine together to get the finishing line completed. It's kind of like a metaphor for life, really. Yeah, exactly. Very true. So, so that's the first one. So most human beings would probably go, 
Okay, that's quite a big one. Um, I'm going to be quite happy with doing just that one challenge. But I know, because I know what's behind the scenes, <laughs> I know that you've chosen not one more, but two more. So, so give us the next one that you're going to be doing, the next part of the trilogy. Well, two months after, well, it finishes in June. July, August time is the season to swim the English Channel, which uh, is around 21 miles from the coast of England to France. Yeah. And yeah, I've committed to com accomplishing that as well, two months after the finishing of RAM. So this one just blows my mind because I know that the training for it is so, so intense. I know you're a really strong swimmer. You've done many races and you've done many long distance things. So I imagine that 21 miles will be very doable for someone of your ilk. Um, but my, my head is just going, how can you actually train for the cycling the way you've got to and, and get that race done? And then with such a short period of time between the race and then going into your swim across the channel, how do you, how do you train for both disciplines? Good. The answer is I don't know yet. Because okay. to be in honesty, it is two years time and I'm making sure I, I deal with a need to know basis. So okay. this year is about amassing the knowledge. Yeah. I'm, you are, you're right in that I have a good base for swimming. So last year I swam nine miles, 14 kilometers off no training at all. Yeah. So I do know I have that, that base, yeah. but it is completely different in the ocean than it is in a river, which is where I was swimming before. Yeah. Um, so I imagine it'll be a lot of temperature training. It, yeah. because the the channel swim is without a wetsuit so i'll be in a bathing costume and if i just i'm just thinking off the top of my head a couple of hours a week so finding a, a local outdoor pool or an outdoor quarry which is water logged and i can swim in if yeah. i if i can swim three or four hours uh, and build it up one day a week so instead of going hitting the beach and reading a book i'll just stay in the water for six hours then yeah. I think that will really get me used to it. One concern I have is the salt water, how, you know, how to breathe in that, because I've heard some very bad horror stories about people you know, burning their throat and it swelling from the salt and not being able to breathe. So that's something I do need to look into. So again, going back to coaching, have you engaged anybody or have you got anybody in mind that you're gonna approach with regards to the channel swim? Not yet. That's the one area that I'm researching who to speak to. I know swimming coaches, but I'm looking for someone a bit more specialist in endurance and outdoor. So, um, yeah, and somebody who's perhaps done it, who can actually give you the, the pitfalls as well as the stuff that's... Because doing the distance, I imagine, you could probably get the distance nailed, but it's more about actually the, the way that sometimes the waves take you and can pull you off course so you can actually see the shore and think you're nearly there. I've done some research myself and then you get drawn away from the shore and you're actually going further down the coastline, which makes it quite difficult. So I, I imagine that the mental strength side of things you'll be fine with, but if you can get somebody who's already done it, that would be really useful, I would imagine. Yeah. I'm, I am speaking to some people, thanks to, I think you've introduced me to somebody who I'm speaking to later this week as well. Yes, um, you Jessica, exactly, yeah. So I was speaking to her actually tonight. And yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best to reach out to as many people as possible and ask for tips, guidance, advice, yeah. who they used. Um, so yeah. Sounds great. So, so you've got 3,000 plus miles to cycle. 21 miles across the channel swimming. So you got a third one. The well, third one? It, it, I am a triathlete at heart. So I love the number three. It's like a magic number to me. And, um, you know, you can be partly to blame for this. How could I not consider... I'm not going to accept blame for this. I'm not going to accept <laughs> any blame whatsoever at any point in time. Never. Okay, don't blame me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how could I not consider summiting Everest the highest peak in the world? So you're going to go from Mont Blanc to Everest and you're going to do these three challenges, the cycling race, the channel swim and summiting Everest because you're not going to just climb it, you're going to summit it. Yeah. 
and what's the sort of timeline on doing these three amazing challenges? So June would be Race Across America, yep. August Swim the Channel, yep. and with, with Everest I'm, I'm very aware of its enormity. This isn't just a mountain you climb because, because you have the resources to do it. So in January of 2023, so that's six months after finishing RAM, I'm yep. moving to Nepal for four months to get altitude training, to, to get mountain experience. And then April of that year is the intention to, to attempt to summit Everest. To climb some other peaks in Nepal. So you're on hand, you're living locally, and you can, I think having been to Nepal a couple of times or a few times now, um, you'll love it. You'll absolutely love Nepal. Um, it's a wonderful country. And I think that you'll, you'll just fall in love with the place. So. I'm a massive fan of respecting the mountains and I think you're probably in that same kind of spiritual place and I think that by actually being absorbed by the country and Kathmandu it's, it's quite um, a sort of an algebra of people um, so to speak and I think it will just make you so much stronger in your attempt to actually climb Everest so I, I think we discussed it very briefly before but I think what you've just said makes a lot of sense and I think it will and like you've also said as well it's not always about the summit and I've climbed mountains where I've not managed to get to the summit for different reasons and it makes you stronger so I think if you go in with a, an attitude where it's not all about the summit it is very much the journey you're just going to have the best time so I think the whole year will be phenomenal which is amazing. And I admire your bravery on attempting all three of them. It's, it's quite a, a stunning challenge. Thank you. And yeah, it's what you said about the spiritual spirituality of the journey. It, it, it definitely is. Yes, it's very physical. It looks very, you know, purely focused in the, the action of the world, the right, the, the left brain. But, but I want to make sure that I embrace, embrace the femininity and embrace the unknown, embrace embrace mother earth and see what she has to deliver because somewhere along this journey it may change we don't know and it's to give myself the, the agility to to just absorb and adore what's happening rather than get completely fixated and attached to what i want to happen yeah and i, and I think on all these kinds of challenges that if you can stay fluid and agile and change as things change it just makes it so much more enjoyable. So rather than, as you say, being regimented and that's um, the only way we're going to do it, you can veer off and do different things, but all with the same goals in, in mind. So the, the three challenges are, are just phenomenal and I'm pretty sure that nobody has ever achieved. I know you've got uh, Everest and the channel is known as Peak, Peak to Pond or I think it's yeah. Peak. So I got think the peak, which is Everest and the pond which is the channel um, and I think there's only about 11 or 12 people that have ever done that so you'll just literally fly into that one within six months um, but I don't think anybody would have ever as far as I know has ever done the three things so is that a kind of world record or is there any there is one man who has done all three his name okay. is Rob Elie Lee um, it wasn't in the race across America, and I don't know the, the distance within the cycle of America, but right. definitely the first ever female and the first ever um, measurable, comp you know, this is now something somebody else could repeat. It's a repeatable yeah. possibility. So what's made you want, what's, what sort of stirred you into going, I'm gonna do these three things? Because I imagine the way it probably started was with one challenge and it's now ended up with three. So explain to me the journey that's taken you from turning this from being a one amazing challenge to three amazing challenges i love embracing what makes me feel uncomfortable or a little bit pushed or pressured because i know that's what growing feels like um and you're right it just it just happened with multiple conversations uh, i believe in that if somebody says to me, such as yourself, what mountain have you considered climbing next? There's a reflection of what you're saying that you can see within me. And so I've, I've been having too many conversations around these three elements with different people for me not to, to put them together. And just like a child, 
a child wouldn't consider their, the, you know, if a five-year-old says, I want to be a fireman or an astronaut, they're not based in logic and going to say, well, actually, my grades in maths are a little lower than the average. Maybe I won't be able to work for NASA. They stay in dream state and they're, they, they're playing astronaut every single day. So I, I love pushing myself into staying in that creative state of in, in an impossible world. You know, no female has ever done what I'm attempting. So, mm -hmm. so it, really, it really keeps me creative. I can't be based in logic because it doesn't exist yet. I have to stay in a world of infinite possibility. And, yeah. and that mindset doesn't just stay in this job, in this one challenge it's now infiltrated in other areas of my life. So my business is now becoming a whole new entity that I've never considered before and, and other parts of you know, where I'm gonna live and my relationship, et cetera, where it's all growing and flourishing together thanks to me having nurtured something that I thought was impossible before. So you mentioned child state and childlike way of thinking of things. I think it kind of is a, time for me to talk to you about where your childhood has led you to become this because you, you you mentioned triathlon uh, I'd like to sort of for you to tell us a little bit more about that but I'd like to find out a little bit more about how young Kate as a, as a child and as a girl kind of got to this place because you don't just suddenly click like that or maybe you do but what interests me and, and we've not spoken about this is where you got to the stage where you thought that you could actually achieve all these great things. And did that happen in your latter years, in the last 10 years? Or has that been something that when you were a girl, a young girl, did you have dreams and aspirations? And also, who influenced you positively in that path? Sure, that's, that's quite a lot of questions in that. So I'll do my best. If I, okay. if I miss something, I'll pull me back. Okay. Yeah, there's like 30 <laughs> questions there. Sorry about that. Um, no, it's good. Um, <laughs> Young so, Kate. Yeah, Amazing young stuff. Kate. There we are. We'll start, we'll start with young Kate. Yeah, I, was, I, I was always curious. So, you know, an example, my, I remember my mum put my first watch on my left hand. And I, and I just asked the question, why do we wear it on our left? And the answer, oh, uh, we'll say eight, I think, okay. plus or minus. Yeah. Uh, and I just said, why, why on my left? And, and the response was, because everyone wears it on our left. And it didn't satisfy me. I was just like, well, what, what will happen if I wear it on my right? So I just mix, simple yeah. example, I just mix my watch up. I'd wear it on my right, wear it on my left, and I notice no difference. What do you do now if, if you have a watch? Um, I actually wear it on my right. Yeah. That's my default. Because um, it's awkward. Built, watches are built to be on your left. So it actually, I have to consciously think about it more to, to use yeah. it. That's so it adds an element of opening yeah sorry i might try that yeah yeah so so yeah but it opened up the question of what else what else is assumed in my life yeah. that that is nonsensical or i'm just taken for granted mm -hmm. so so that added you know that curiosity state whenever something happened i'd ask why why does it happen yeah. this way yeah yeah it's interesting for an eight-year-old Mm, yeah, I suppose it is. Okay. Not having children, I have no point of comparison because to, to me it's normal to do that, but you know. I think it's a very young age to be questioning things like that, but it probably explains a lot. So going along that path. <laughs> I call my dad. <laughs> when did you get to the stage where you can first remember and I want to do that and it's quite special because you mentioned triathlon and challenges and things one one big example actually happened when i was uh, in university so i studied engineering so I'm, i've got a double masters in mechanical engineering and for my third year um i did a, a gap year sandwich year in france so i worked in french industry and when i came back to portsmouth my university in england they said i couldn't carry on with my french language studies and that question of why still, still came to me. So I actually challenged my faculty and took it to the Dean of the university. And I was the first ever student of a non-language studies to learn a second language. So I actually learned Spanish because right. I, 
I, I saw it as unfair to stop the potential learning. So, so I, you know, I, I'm now fluent in Spanish as well, thanks to me standing up for, for the system that didn't work. Yeah. Um, so I think it was always in me to, to keep growing and expanding. But I think the big, the big click for me was, because I, I was still kind of in society, you know, I, don't, I like to challenge it, but I don't like breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. um, so it uh, was when, in 2012, when I was about to get married to a guy I'd been with for nine years. And it was, it's interesting because if we drift, or oh, I drift, but when we're given the, de the decider or that, you know, this is now forever and the drifting is a commitment, that's when I sort of went, I'm committing to this for the rest of my life. Now, mm -hmm. this, is, this is an unworkable relationship on many levels. It, it wasn't, it was quite toxic. I was being quite suppressed. I felt very manipulated throughout that relationship. And I, I, I put my hands up and say that I'm sure I played a big part of that as well, because it takes two to tango in that level. But I'd also had the choice to, to say yes to it forever or no. Yeah. And I said yes to marrying him. And it was six days before our wedding that what was interesting, so I'm still very left brain during this process, I'm still very logical and, and rationalizing, but the closer we got to our wedding day, my dreams lost their color. I couldn't dream in color, I only had black and white, and then the image would go all fuzzy, and then I would feel, wake up shivering, so my dreams were shutting down the joy of life. I could only dream of bad things, I'd wake up like a nightmare every day, um, yeah. And so my unconsciousness was obviously doing its best to get through to me to say, this is not the life you want. And, and six days before our wedding, in a, in a weird twist of fate, he actually broke up with me. And that was the cliff edge moment when I had to have that conversation with myself to say, you know, you've been drifting far too long from now on we need a bit of purpose in your life. We need to make sure that you put yourself, you know, Kate, you need to put yourself first. You need to make sure you're, you're looked after, you're healthy, you're well, you're loved by yourself. You know, I need to love myself. Yeah. Because it's not happening anymore. Did you have friends around you that could support you in that or did you have to do that yourself? Because that's, that's a massive, massive part of your life, isn't it? Yeah, well, he, he was monitoring my phone. So even though my ex worked abroad six weeks of the eight, if I left the guest house that we owned together, I would get a call from him asking me where I was going. Wow. So I, I had a very small circle of friends. I had two, maybe three friends. And I lived in a village of 2000 people in a remote area of Australia. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm Welsh. A lot of my old friends and my family were, were 12 hours time zone away um, so I was quite isolated but the two or three friends I had were, were like family and hugely supportive and it, it sometimes involved just getting drunk some nights and you know partying and dancing as if the world didn't exist but other mm -hmm. nights it was that deep work of talking it out and crying till there was no more tears yeah. so you know they for the very few friends I had, they were, they were absolute gold to me and, yeah. and really pillars and rocks to give me the space to kick out, to get angry and then to feel, you know, terrible and complain about everyone in the world and then to build it up slowly where I was ready to pick it up and own it and say, okay, I still have this. What am I going to do about it now? And what age were you when this happened? So that was eight years ago and I'm 41 now so 33 yeah so so where was your triathlon career along this process it hadn't even started okay. I had started running uh, during my engagement uh, Freud would love that as an analogy that he very would. can't run away <laughs> take up running um, <laughs> And again, it was, in, it was in one of those moments, conversation with my friends that they were like, well, what can you do for you? You know, you, you, you're talking about putting yourself first, but what, 
what can you actually do? Not for work, not for the debt, not for the laws to your exes put on you, but what can you actually put in your life for just yourself? And that reminded me of a dream 10 years ago that I had of being an Ironman triathlete that I'd given up ironically after a conversation with my ex fiance who told me that, you know, I was sporty enough and didn't really need to do it. So, you know, I'll miss you if you go running. I'll miss you if you go swimming. Why wow. not stay at home with me? Wow, emotionally blackmailing me. That's um, quite a thing. That's, that's mm. abuse. That's not good, not healthy. So, so was that, do you think that was a trigger as well that you actually were like, actually, I'm going to do it now because I can? Yeah, definitely. Similar to my father in Mont Blanc, you know, today is the youngest I'll ever be. You yep. know, I don't know, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. Like we, I know we play like we think we do, but we have no idea. I mm. never saw myself in debt and quite, you know, insecure of myself because I was always confident. I didn't ever imagine myself to be this low and this sad before. So what's no. not to say tomorrow would be worse. So today could be the best I ever have. Exactly. So, so going back to the try, when did you actually spot, you had the previous ideas while you were in the relationship with your fiance about doing Iron Man. So that was obviously a planted seed. And then was it that you suddenly saw some sunshine and that was starting to be watered, that it started to grow after the relationship? Yes. Yeah. It, it just, it, it gave me the permission. Now I had this external goal to yeah. start, stop feeding the excuses and start feeding the possibility. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, I, I did work 10 hour days. I owned a guest house that I was working in it seven days a week. Uh, and it's very long hours being in hospitality, as, as you know, um, having your own cafe with your daughter. But, um, but it, it meant I had to grow. I had to stop using the time to complain about how hard my life was and carve out a run in the morning at four in the morning or go cycling at 8 p.m. at night with my head torch. You know, there was no, it was either achieve greatness or live in excuses and being reasonable. It's not, it's not a lesser game. It's just, I was living a reasonable life and I wanted to step up and be unreasonable for once in my life. So is that something that you think you can actually um, give to people as a takeaway that are watching and listening to this? That Because I often hear people put excuses in the way and say, I've got a job or I've got children or I've got various things that will stop them from actually doing some of the things that they say they want to do. I'm not saying about forcing yourself on people, but if people are nervous and scared of being able to commit to doing these things, would you suggest then that you, you can make the time? I suggest that we have a lot more potential in our life because I, I appreciate there are immensely busy people. There are people who have a lot more in their life than I, I have currently have. But it's our choice where we spend our, our time at the end of the day. Yeah. So, so I think we, we use being reasonable far too often. Yeah. It's as if that's, a, that's the disease of society. Society's given us an excuse to play small and it's acceptable to use the excuses rather than be held to account for our dreams. I would love my friends more to give me more shit about missing Friday night at the pub because I'm doing something that will drive my business, my life, my career, my goals forward. Yeah. Um, you know, we missed you having a few pints last night. Where were you? The tally showed blah, blah, blah. You know, hold me to my greatness, not my but mediocrity. You when you started on this journey, did you position yourself with a race in mind that you were going to do? I positioned myself to be my best. So this unlocking the glass ceiling was definitely present. So even before completing a half Ironman, I said I wanted to be them. I was training to be like a world champion. Right. So I, I copied the mindset of a world champion, but had no idea if I could actually accomplish it physically. But yeah. I knew if I didn't aim for it, I'd never get anywhere near it. That's very interesting. So where did you get that? Where did you learn those skills from? Um, I, well, let me just think. It was anywhere. If we look in our lives, so for me in, in Australia, as I said, I was training alone. I just looked at people that I saw up to good things. It could, it, one of them was a quilter. She was an amazing quilter and cross-stitcher. I saw her dedication and commitment 
and how she, you know, every Tuesday night she'd be quilting for three hours. I copied her, her passion for that. Wow. So I took inspiration from everyone in my world. Who to know, eh? I wonder, have you ever told her how she inspired you? I, um, well, I used to quilt with them. So yes, I used to every Wednesday night wow. go and meet them and, and quilt That's with cool. them. But yeah, I've told them. <laughs> Amazing what you do yourself that can influence and inspire others, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Where, but it's, where, it's, sorry. I was going to say, it's part of that mindset as well. Like we, we don't need people who are medalists or champions and this and that to, to see the magic. Every single person in our life from from every level, from the person who serves us in the shop to the bus driver to, to the person we walk in the street, there's gold in their life that we can take and mirror and step up in our own lives too. It's very much about passion and hard work, isn't it? I think if you've got the passion and you're willing to work hard, you can achieve most things personally. That's the way I kind of look at my life. I don't know if you agree on that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not just... We need to definitely fuel it. Like the potential energy is the dream, but the kinetic energy, the momentum is where the magic happens. Yeah, totally. So, so tell us about the first race that you did, that you trained for. It was, let me just think when it was. It was in February. So the, the 8th of December should have been my, my wedding. Mm -hmm. The end of February was my first day off from work. So I'd worked full time till then. And I flew to Tasmania to compete in a standard distance triathlon. And uh, I don't know how, but I finished 12th in my age group. Mm -hmm. um, my clothes were 10 years old. My bicycle was 15 years old. And a lot of people there looked very professional and I was in very outdated, obviously worn clothes. Yeah. Um, so there's a bit of shame around how I looked, but looking at my time and realizing that even on a non-triathlon bike, even wearing trainers that were seven years old, I managed to, to compete. Yeah, yeah. And it was speaking to the athletes afterwards, because I wasn't an athlete, I was just a girl who came with a bike and raced. They were talking about their, their journey, because a few of them had qualified for world championships in, in London that year, thanks to that race. Yeah. And that's when the penny dropped, when they said, oh, you could have qualified. You were only X minutes off your qualifying spot. Yeah. That's when I thought, my golly, this could go a little bit further than I thought. <laughs> Funny how it triggered. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what was the journey after that? The journey was to start competing in longer distances, so half Ironman and full Ironman distances. Yeah. So in a time frame. February 2013 was my standard distance. By October of that year, I had become number one in my age group in long distance triathlon, which is just a bit further than a half Ironman, and automatically qualified for world championships the year afterwards. So I was national champion, and that was my fourth ever triathlon. And within a year and a half, I'd completed also my first Ironman. I came 10th in my age group. Which, which, which was the greatest I ever did. So I want to make note that I wanted always to be world champion in Ironman. That was my goal. My limit was 10th. And I'm very happy with that because I knew I put my heart and soul in it and I found my natural ceiling. You know, so my natural ceiling was 10th in Ironman, but number one in two thirds Ironman in long distance. So- You can always revisit that for age group. Because age group- is, means it opens up more doors for you. So never say never, I think. Yeah. And you're going to be pretty fit in 2023. <laughs> Definitely, very true. That would yeah. be quite funny. <laughs> but that's, that's pretty amazing. So that's kind of taken you to where you've come through. Now, I know another thing I wanted to touch on was sustainability. Because yeah. I know it's something that's very near and dear to you. So what I wanted to try and do is talk to you and let you talk about how you think about sustainability in, in various guises, but to see if we can inspire some people that are actually watching and listening to this podcast so that they can actually make a change in their own life or lives. And then that this podcast has actually got some impact on the world. So with a, with a place to now talk about sustainability, what kind of areas do you think people, could make improvements in 
and where do you see your life going on the sustainability piece? Thank you for that. Yeah, sustainability is an interesting topic. It's, it's quite a buzzword at the moment, like it's being used a lot in business as well as, you know, in our own lives. Um, but to me, sustainability is about making sure that, that my life is bettered and also the lives of others. That's in short how I see it. I don't see it as me having to you know, do without, do less, use less, not travel as much. So I believe there is a way that I can still live an abundant life whilst also making my footprint and my impact is positive as well. Mm -hmm. so, so to bring that into like tangible world life, everything we do has an impact. Even me not doing something impacts somebody. And so it's just an extra level of thoughtfulness. It's about asking who else does this impact? Who else does this hurt or help or hinder? And again, my, my favorite question of why, when we go into a supermarket, not relevant for us because we, we don't eat meat, but if we see a two pound chicken or a $5 chicken, ask the question, how is it so cheap? What was compromised? What level of efficiency was introduced that, that made it so, so, so uneconomically sensible? Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, sustainability is just asking those maybe tricky questions or second degree questions to make sure that that we know how things are done and that it's done fairly. You know, the one thing about in the news at the moment about sustainability and a big topic is fashion, sustainable fashion. Yeah. When we buy a T-shirt for three pounds or a couple of dollars, if we just think about it, how could a T-shirt be made for anything less than, say, 15 if we think about the material, the land that it's grown on, the transportation, the people who actually made it and harvested the, the cotton, if it is made of cotton, it's sustainability is just about asking those questions to make sure that everyone involved in the process is left with a positive feeling afterwards. So what one takeaway would you give to people that are watching and listening to this? ask ask those questions ask how is it that price and who was what was part of the process to create create it i, I appreciate this is on the consumer topic yeah but yeah but it's about just saying what what impact does it have me having this in my life or me buying this object to other yeah. people and also the environment around us okay and what would you say has been the biggest thing that you've done with regards to sustainability yourself and how you impact it, the world. it can't be ignored but not eating meat and animal products yeah. the the amount of uh, pressure put on the land to grow the produce to feed the animals to then grow the animals to be fed to us is colossal and yeah. i was watching a documentary about food production and you know we have a billion cows on the planet we have a billion sheep we have a billion pigs as well i think like 30 billion chickens where are they being kept and how are they being fed that that is a huge pressure on an infrastructure to grow very limited amount of species it, it's it's a closed loop in the sense of a negative closed loop it's only taking it's not really giving so, so yeah anybody watching and listening have you got any documentaries that you would recommend for people to watch I really like um, What the Health. Okay. I like Forks Over Knives, which is based on the book called The China Study. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the books by Brendan Brazier called Thrive. And I'm very much into sharing consciousness and awareness for people to make choices rather than yeah. the fear factor of hurt and pain and judgment. So yeah. what I'm suggesting is very much open and awareness for people to make their own decisions. But research and look into things and then make your own choices. Yeah, yeah. And being closed minded. And you'll laugh at this. The one book I read that got me on the thinking process of how my food interacts with my health as well as the world yeah. is called The Beauty Detox Diet. <laughs> Definitely not Kate Longish. No, uh, it was recommended by a friend. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's very, it's a, it's a green book, uh, a very beautiful, slim lady sh showing a red apple, you can imagine this example, but hugely filled with very interesting stats and scientific reports. So the Beauty Detox Diet is a very good book as well. Sounds great. So hopefully we can impact people by people picking up these kinds of docos and books 
and making their own choices. And if we change one person's mindset, that's a really healthy thing. So on, on that note, and I'm conscious of time, so I'm, I'm looking at the time. And one of the things that I often play through with people that I work with is the rocking chair analogy of when you're in your 80s or 90s and you're sort of in the latter years of your life and you're sitting on the deck, sitting in that rocking chair and you're looking back and you're looking at how your life has been. How would you like to be in that rocking chair if you can be in that place? What would you like your life to have looked like? I'd like in a, in a few sentences for me to look back with a smile on my face, you know, covered in scars and wrinkles and creases. And, you know, to know that, you know, I, I lived a full life. That if anyone was to see me on that rocking chair, they'd point and go, look at Kate, she lived life to the max. And yeah. she got other people to live a better life too. I just started that seed of thought and consciousness. Yeah. Not, not to-do lists and how-to solutions, but just got people thinking more and doing more that impacted their own lives the way they want to impact it. So kind of inspiring them in whatever way it sort of takes them on their journey. So by actually looking and listening to you in whatever guise that is over, maybe over the next two or three years of where you're doing your challenges and the stuff that we've talked about today, being inspired. Because that's the thing, isn't it? If you can inspire people with your actions, a bit like the quilter, who unbeknownst to her, inspired you to work hard and I think that's an amazing story it's probably one that you haven't seen the power of but the fact that it's influenced you in that kind of degree I think sometimes we all forget we get caught up in our own worlds and we forget how sometimes the most simple of things can actually impact upon people because people are often looking and watching how you behave which is why I think it's always good to sort of be forging that good path if that makes sense you know you never know who's out there watching and if you can inspire people I think that's quite a, a cool thing to have as your almost as your epitaph I suppose which I don't yeah. want to dwell on um <laughs> so again conscious of time when you interviewed me you came up with some quick fire questions at the end so I put a couple of couple of just just very simple ones quick ones but how weird are you on a level of one to ten and why oh gosh I have to be ten um why because um i will in the middle of a street just do a silly dance pretend to be those dolls when you Brilliant. press the button and they go all floppy um Brilliant. yeah yeah just to just to just to lighten the mood <laughs> when you're with people or just when you're alone because i'll i need to when i'm with people when you're with people you just do a little dance yeah okay and what else because that that's definitely a 10 that's maxing out of 10 <laughs> Give me one more example because oh, that's one a, more example. I'm just I'm trying to think. Um, I can't think of another example at the moment. It'll come to me in a minute. Another example of me being wacky and weird is more just saying things, not inappropriate as in rude, but just as in curious, getting people curious. I'm I was in a, my name for you on my phone. It's going to be curious, Kate. Uh, yeah, I was in the shop two days ago and. Um, so I was talking to my partner who was behind me and I said, how are you, sweetie? And the, the lady serving us answered me. And so from then on, I was, I've called her sweetie ever since. But made it a, oh, of course you're my sweetie, but don't say it in front of him, he'll get jealous. And I could see her enjoying it, but also, you know, it's a bit of a challenge because it is a, th a potential threat if, if it's a partner. It's outside the parameters of normal. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. is good and healthy, I think. So, yeah. Which are two great examples. So, thank you for that. Um, and also, if you could have a billboard and have anything that you wanted put on the billboard, what would you do? What would it say? What would it look like? What would the picture be? What would the words be? That's interesting. My first immediate response was put a mirror and have a slogan saying, this is the face that the people have to look at it, make sure it's a happy one. I love that. That's fantastic. I think, don't, don't think you need to go any further than that. I think that's a great knee jerk reaction. And that's maybe, again, another metaphor for life really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Super. So last question, just one nugget one takeaway piece of advice 
you could give to everybody listening. It could be absolutely anything. I'm going to pad and talk a minute to give you some time to think about it. But your key takeaway for everybody that's listening and watching this so that it can improve their lives and improve the world. Because as I've talked about for interviewing you, my purpose for interviewing you is that we can all understand more about you. And I'm a big fan of leaving the world better than we found it. And I think that you can do that. And that's, I think, what people will get from this interview. As a last nugget of gold takeaway, what, would, what advice would you give to people? Treat every single moment and every single interaction as if it is that, that moment we'll look back on as it changed our game and it changed our life. So every person I speak to, I speak to as if this is going to change my life. Yeah. Because it adds so much more presence and it makes sure that I'm, I'm there, hungry to find the gold because it's there. So mm -hmm. it's treat every moment as if it's the, the game changing moment. Brilliant. Okay. And finally, where can we find you? Where can people look in and listen at this podcast? Find you, Kate Strong, online. Sure. So my website is katestrong.co. I'm social, so find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And also drop me an email, kate at katestrong.co. I want to hear what you guys are up to. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you for giving us all your insight into your life. And good luck with every challenge that you take on from now on. Thank you so much, Jeff, and likewise.